Hello and welcome to Crowd Supplies Teardown Sessions. I'm your host, Helen Lee, and I'm really excited about the next hour or so. Today's Teardown Session stream is sponsored by the lovely folks at Xilinx as part of the FPGA Playground Programme. And aside from this extra stream, that also means that Xilinx have generously provided us with lots of special hardware to give away during the stream, um, as well as a precursor that we're giving away as part of uh, on Friday. We're giving away a whole precursor on Friday. Um, and the way that you find information about that is you head over to um, the Xilinx page on crowdsupply.com, which is um, slash FPGA Playground. Um, and you can see a big subscribe to updates button right there. Everybody who is subscribed to updates by Friday will be entered in a chance to win a precursor, which is very exciting. And actually the odds are pretty good. So do go along and we will never spam you or um, email you anything um, that's not exciting and about FPGAs um, and fun giveaways. Okay, um, so I'm, let's move that. So um, on the stream, I will normally give away um, a box of mystery hardware for people who comment at different timestamps. But today, because it is a special stream, we, I'm going to show you what you can win. And we've actually got three of these boxes. Um, so inside of these boxes, we've got a Xilinx Basis 3 FPGA um, dev board, which has got the Xilinx Arctic 7 on it. You've also got um, this wonderful WTF PGA booklet inside. And some Xilinx t-shirts, socks, pop sockets, pens, all sorts of goodies, okay? So we've got three of these to give away during the stream with a Basis 3 um, FPGA board. Um, and the way that we win those is I have written down three timestamps um, on, on a piece of paper on my desk. And if your comment or question is closest to the timestamps on my desk, you will win one of these. And that is open to anywhere in the world that we are allowed to ship to. So please do keep your comments and questions coming because it makes us feel less like we are shouting into a void and less alone. Please do, um, please do keep those comments coming. So without further ado, I am going to bring on um, the wonderful Bunny and the Zogs. That's, ooh, we can hear you. Yep, hello, can you hear us? Wonderful. <laughs> So this is Andrew, Bunny Huang, and, um, and Sean, Sean Cross, also known as Zobs, and they are the creators of The Precursor, coming to us live from a bar in Singapore. Well, first yep. of all, cheers. Cheers, yeah. cheers, 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 yep, yeah. cheers. Yeah. 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 cheers. <laughs> there we go, maintaining eye contact across the internet, because we know the yeah, rules. That's right, <laughs> we know the rules. <laughs> we, go. we know the rules, we know the yeah. rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's kick off. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the precursor, you know, what it is, where it comes from, and what, in fact, it is a precursor to. You want to do it or you want me to do it? <laughs> yeah, so I'll start off with it. Okay. Um, so the precursor, the idea of the precursor is it's supposed to be a device um, that gives you a reason to trust it. Um, the problem, the incipient problem is that uh, technology has gotten complex to the point where I can't even say if my phone has a back door or not, if I can trust the Intel management engine in my laptop, whatever it is, these types of things. And even if you were to give me the full source code for something, I wouldn't have the time to analyze it anyways. So uh, Precursor is a device that tries to roll back the clock to sometime around the early 2000s when technology was still a bit more uh, you know, um, accessible to individuals. And, uh, and we have, uh, create a system based on FPGAs using uh, RISC V CPUs. And Sean has one here and I have a couple here. You can see them, we can, we can hold them up for the camera and see what they look like. These are our devices. Um, yeah. So this one here has, a, this one here has the uh, steel case on the backside. So you can see the shine off the back. Uh, this one has uh, the aluminum case, which is the standard edition. And Sean has a limited edition uh, front bezel on his. Uh, and so that's it. You know, there's a little bit of an aspect as well of sort of uh, an ability to customize the devices, as you can see, uh, taking advantage of the whole uh, sort of open source nature of it. Sorry for the background noise, it's a construction project across the way. And, um, and so, yes, on the inside, there's, a, there's an FPG on the inside. We build the CPU uh, from source. Uh, mm -hmm. So you so you can understand everything that's going on inside the CPU. Um, 
the circuit boards, of course, are open source. You can inspect them. Um, and then the operating system, which Sean wrote, uh, is you know open source from the ground up. And the whole thing is, the whole idea is that you can now put simple applications on it. Um, simple meaning like a chat client or like a voice call, a uh, crypto wallet, uh, some authenticator token, password vault, that kind of thing. A simple one. So it's not like, you know, you're not going to play AAA game titles. You're not going to have a web browser on it. And um, and you can trust that it will keep those secrets for you, right? That, 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 that you actually have a reason to believe that you're not going to be compromised in some way or the other. So that's basically mm -hmm. the, uh, the project and the motivation behind it. And what came before the precursor? Because I know it came, I know, so before that, it, you came, I, I came across the precursor actually before it came out. When you, I watched the talk that you did at Congress. Right, 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 um, right. What was yeah. that, 2018, I want right, to say? Right, right, I right, right, right. I can't remember what, what year it was. And, and that was the, the, the trusted, um, right, this whole right. like hardware security, yeah. like the top two. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> there's, there's, there's this huge lineage actually that it comes from. It actually start. It started actually from back when we did Novena, and um, right. and we built you know quote unquote an open source laptop. Oh yeah, yeah, right there. An <laughs> open source one. laptop. Yeah, yay! Oh look at it. There, you can there see it is. Inside. There it yeah, is. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, yeah. 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 brings yeah. back memories. Yeah. So so yeah. we built it, and 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 one of the first questions people said is, were you building it open source to make it more secure? And the answer actually was no. I mean, because because the thing is, is like we actually built open source because we want to know if we could build it or not. But security wasn't an objective, and the reason why it couldn't be is because there were closed source silicon blobs, there were bootloaders. We knew what was on the inside, and so we actually knew how potentially insecure it could be. Right. So that was sort of like the seed planted of like, huh, here's a problem because we actually built something and, and got to know all the problems on the inside. And then um, there's this long arc where. Uh, I ended up uh, doing a, a small project with Ed Snowden to try and build a, a phone that can be turned into dark mode so they won't spy on you. And then that turned into this other thing that was called SIGLAP, which no one ever heard about, but it was like, it actually got as far as doing CAD models and, and schematics, whatever it is. Uh, uh, it was actually the precursor, the precursor, the precursor. And it was terrible <laughs> because because it was, it, was, it was designed into a laptop form factor and was only allowed to communicate to the internet by an audio jack. So it was like a complete like 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 par <laughs> paranoia mode. Like we don't even use the internet. It goes all through acoustic modem, right? Really super like awful paranoid mode. And and the problem with it was that basically no one would use it. Like like I talked to some potential users, like there's no way I'm I'm not gonna carry around another device that's you know so inconvenient. <laughs> and so and so then that evolved into be trusted, which which was the sort of the idea was to create a high watermark for capability. Like, what do we need it to do? So the SIGLAP went too far cutting things down. It got too simple and too unusable. And we're like, okay, mm -hmm. it, needs to, it needs to be usable by humans of all languages. So Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, Arabic, mm -hmm. you know, all the difficult languages um, yeah. to get right so to So not left. just ASCII. Not just ASCII, um, vision yeah, impaired. Yeah. So we have a version that has braille capabilities on it. So really, thinking about humans first and getting mm -hmm. to use the, the device uh, in their native language, which actually in itself, that just that one specifier is really hard because human language is tough. Yes. <laughs> like, you, <laughs> Unic Unicode is hard. Uh, uh, font maps are hard. Glyphs are hard. It's, it is a huge problem. And actually, that pretty much, once you can handle that, that sets the space for everything, all the cryptographic stuff on the inside is actually simpler in terms of you know, like computational requirements than the language requirement. And then, you know, um, a more commonly available, but still limited attack surface uh, network port. We chose Wi-Fi at the end of the day. Um, and sort of we eschewed things like 3G and LTE because of there's a whole lot of issues, but including like the, the baseband modem blobs and the certification yeah. issues and the cost and yeah. regional differences. And we just, you know, there's a whole Pandora's box we didn't want to touch. And, most people can turn their phones into hotspots anyways and connect by Wi-Fi. And honestly, if you're trying to trust a device, you shouldn't have it 100, 24 seven, constantly connected to the internet anyways. Maybe you want to be able to turn off the internet on it, right? Just to keep it safe. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And and, uh, and 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 so that that device, the idea was to create a out of the box experience that, uh, you know, my criteria is my mom could use, right? Uh, I love my mom, but she's terrible at technology. And if my mom, <laughs> couldn't figure out how to use it and she had to install Python to run it or whatever it is. It wasn't going to happen. My mom doesn't install Python. My, you know, it's, it's, 
And so, and so, um, and so that was be trusted. Uh, and then we got started on this project and realized, holy shit, the amount of software that goes into that is enormous. Like it's like, like it's, it, we're never going to finish that. And so we finished the hardware before the software mm. and, and the hardware without the software is called precursor. It's a precursor yes. okay. to be trusted. It's a precursor actually to many things. Right. And so we are focusing primarily on this be trusted use case of this sort of multi-language communications. Like, but the idea of precursors is now a thing that anyone can take and turn it into the thing that they need. So if I want a crypto wallet and I don't care about any of this stuff, you can just take precursor, write your custom wallet on it, and that's the only application it runs, and that's fine, right? We're not going to fight with you over what it does. It's just it's precursor. There's no um, – because part, other part of the problem is that with Be Trusted, part of the thing about um, – making technology for people who aren't technology people use is you have to brand it and 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 the brand has to stand for a, a certain set of guarantees and so if we want to make a big tent it's hard for us to pull in everyone's contributions and still call it be trusted right because we have to be like well we can't take your thing because you pulled in this huge attack surface of libraries even though it's a great application it's kind of obnoxious right and so by making a thing called precursor people are able to take that put their application on it and if they have different parameters and they want to pull in a huge attack surface library that's fine i don't care run it on it it's a precursor and you do your thing and so that's yeah. the current round of hardware yeah. yeah i mean one of the things about this particular project is that it runs this custom operating system SUS, it's a microkernel operating system and that's just because linux while it's really cool is such a large thing that while it could run on here we haven't been focusing on Having said that, I fully expect that when this is released, one of the first things somebody will do is port Linux to it and get it running as well. It seems extremely likely. Yeah. And you know, well, that's okay. That's fine. That yeah. is yeah. well within the scope of the precursor project. Go for it's it. It's not yeah. within the scope yeah. of the yeah. trusted yeah. project, yeah. but as a hardware platform, we're okay with that. Yeah. Right. Right. So so you've done the vast majority of the software oh, yeah, development yeah, yeah. for uh, around this pro around this pro project, correct? Um, so, I said you've done the vast majority of the software around their hardware project. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so the, the original yeah. uh, so, kernel and uh, the yeah. uh, Reno actually for simulating it on the PC. If you want to execute the, uh, the risk five code directly, you can take a binary and run it either on the hardware or run it within the Reno emulator on, uh, on a PC or Mac or Linux. Uh, yeah, that was all something that I had put together. Yeah, that's really amazing. I, I was I, I see your blog post on Renode, which I really enjoyed reading. Um, I, there's still quite a few people that don't know about Renode. So for, for people who don't know, like, do you want do you want to tell them a little bit about what Renode does and how you use it in your workflow? Um, sure. If if you uh, work with PCs, you'll know that uh, QMU is usually what people use for executing non-native code on a PC. For example, I know Docker uses QMU a lot to create, for example. Uh, ARM targeted binaries on an x86 machine. QMU is great for what it does, and it does have certain uh, embedded devices in it, but it's kind of difficult to extend. And it is not the best when it comes to some of the debugging features. What Renode is, is it's uh, written in C sharp, and it is very easy to extend, to add new peripherals. For example, with Be Trusted, Precursor. We have so many custom peripherals. Uh, we wanted to. We have three different timers that uh, are completely bespoke. We have a completely bespoke crypto engine that does EB25519 cryptography. If we were to use QMU for that, which is the current standard, um, that would be a complete fork. You'd have to download it, compile it yourself. But with Renode, because it's written in C sharp, I can create a model. For this cryptography engine in C sharp, and you don't even have to have a C sharp compiler because it's built into the C sharp language that uh, you just run Reno. It sees the source file, compiles it, creates the memory map for the emulated device, and maps it in. Um, and then any memory writes in the virtual emulated platform goes to that emulated um, modeled uh, peripheral which is why the exact same binary runs on both real hardware and in the emulated Renode machine. On top of that, it's very good at uh, supporting multiple 
peripherals in the system, most, most, sorry, multiple cores in the mm. system. Right. So Reno uh, Precursor has the main SOC that drives the screen, but it also has a separate embedded controller that is what deals with um, uh, the power management and networking and all of that. And uh, Renode is able to emulate those two at the same time in real time, complete with time steps and keep them in that sync. Uh, well, have allowed them to talk to one another. So it's this very powerful system that is open source and free, uh, comes from Ant Micro, and has been instrumental in developing the firmware, the operating system, and all the software for Precursor. Yeah. yeah. The Ed 255 emulator was super cool. Like, you pull it off so fast. I, I think I think one thing he, he maybe didn't mention is just how productive he can be putting out those different modules. I will spend like two or three months building the hardware model for this thing, agonizing over it. And I'll hand over the spec and like two days later, he's like, yep, yeah, I got to work in an emulation. Runs the code just fine. Found a bug. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> we actually had a contribution. Uh, somebody downloaded the operating system and ran it in the v Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, they said, oh, we're going to add more tests to the cryptography uh, suite. Mm. And uh, you know, they said, uh, yeah, it works great. It passes all the tests. And then Bunny ran it on real hardware, and it failed. Yeah. One particular test failed. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out there was a bug in the hardware. Yeah. It was not in the software. Yeah. So somebody somewhere in the world contributed a patch that was able to suss out this bug in hardware. Not even actually getting yeah. Before we even ship hardware, someone someone found a bug in the hardware before it shipped, which I think might be a record for an open source project. <laughs> um, so something that I've been really enjoying with the precursor is digging into um, the, com the your component choices because you're very considered exactly why you've chosen exact you know each one. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your design decisions and the trade offs that came with them. For example, your keyboard, your screen, um, any of those kind of peripheral parts. You know. Sure, sure. I'll take that one. Um, the so the the screen, for example, uh, one of the things. So part of the the overall project concept was to make sure you could trust everything from the human to the computer, and so we considered the screen and the keyboard as part of the tech surface. So the problem with, for example, a keyboard, a virtual keyboard on a on a typical touchscreen device is that the touchscreen drivers themselves, devices have microcontrollers inside with firmware blobs that we can't inspect. And you can easily record the touch points and figure out what you're typing, log them into a tiny little AK buffer and have a ton of taps in there and then blast them out by I2C later on and, and exfiltrate them. So, so we built the keyboard using a physical mechanical keyboard. And, you know, it's got a little clicky, clicky, clicky keyboard here. And, and, and this keyboard is actually a, uh, an overlay that can be swapped out with different languages. Again, we wanted to make it uh, multilingual. So we shipped the devices with uh, a, a German keyboard, a French keyboard, a Dvorak keyboard, because I type Dvorak even on my mobile devices, and a QWERTY keyboard, and a blank one. So you're going to get one that's actually just completely black. And you can use like a silver ink pen or something to write your own whatever, uh, you know, Carmack layout, whatever it is, the current new thing. You know, you, could, you can make your own thing if you want. Um, and we also have like a Hangul keyboard in the works and some other ones that are being requested. Um, and so, and so you, the way you, of course you have to get a screwdriver out to replace the keyboard, but we're not afraid of screwdrivers here. Uh, you take off the bezel, you pull out the, the overlay, pop a new one, put the screws in, and then you're in a new overlay. Um, and so that's the keyboard side. The, the screen, we want a similar sort of level of, I guess, you know, transparency, you could say. Um, and, uh. And so we could have gone with a, uh, a full color TFT screen, um, considered it, but I wanted something still, the problem is, is there's still a chip on the inside of a, of a TFT screen that has a full frame buffer on the inside and we don't know what it does. And so just to be completely pedantic about it, we went with this black and white display. Uh, it's actually a high PPI screen, 200 DPI. So it's, it's actually like not 
terrible in terms of resolution. Um, and it also has this wonderful property that uh, it can actually retain its contents with the power basically cut. So this device here, you can see the screen looks like it's on, but actually the CPU is fully off. Nothing's driving it. It's kind of like an e-ink display in a way, a very low power display. It can retain this uh, image for, I mean, we, you know, actually most of the power here is actually being consumed by the Wi-Fi trying to check to see if there's a packet coming in. Um, if we just do the screen itself, it'd be basically forever. And so, and so we use that to sort of uh, save power, um, to go ahead and put standby screens on, these types of things. And the other really cool aspect of this is that um, uh, with the screen itself, if you were to sort of peel back the backlight mechanism, which is a different problem, uh, you can actually hold a very bright light behind it and you actually inspect the transistors one at a time. It's actually big enough that a standard optical microscope can see the transistors inside the screen. And so now you can draw a path I've a entirely. Uh, I've got a picture yeah. of the back of the, the PCB up, um, on the screen, by the way, in case you can't. Okay, just cool. So you know that it's, it's up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in our in our, in our in our view, we actually just see a big blank spot. So <laughs> we don't we don't, see, we don't we don't get to see what you're showing. Um, so so the the uh, the the um, yeah. So the idea is that you, you can now go from CPU instructions that are executing on a computer you have compiled from source. Um, you know, on OS you're running from source, and you can actually be confident all the way to the actionable TFT elements that the data is what you what you believe it is. And the, and the OS itself is similarly a bit paranoid in that we try to, you know, have the secure enclaves, things that provision the mm. root keys, be directly responsible for driving, um, like, the, the font maps and the primitives. We don't trust, uh, you know, a third-party library to go ahead and render these things. Because the whole idea is you, you know, one of, the, one of my things that always bothers me, like on my mobile phone, is that every now and then a, a box will pop up that says type a password in it. Um, and, it, you know, it's just this Pavlovian response. You start typing your thing, and I go, wait, is this that application or is it another application? It just popped up, right, in the middle with no context, no nothing. And so, but you have really no way to kind of know because all these background services are going. And, mm -hmm. and you know, while there hasn't been, like, a high-profile exploit taking advantage of that yet today, I just feel like this is one of those uh, human exploits that is going to become more and more common as the back doors inside the hardware and the software become more and more sealed. And I don't want our device to become, you know, uh, subject to human exploits at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a couple of questions around that and some comments. So people asking, um, does the keyboard have a PS slash two input so I can use a Model M? Um, <laughs> we've got um, someone asking, is it about the screen? Is it memory LCD or sharp hybrid memory display? Yeah. Um, okay. And, no, and take the keyboard? Asked, I yeah, go okay, on. Cool. And then someone said, I presume they're MOSFETs rather than BJTs. Um, and then someone's asked, has anyone done any exploring with the Braille slash non-screen version? Yeah. Okay. So there's some keyboard questions Four there questions. and like okay. a couple of uh, display questions. Okay. I mean, the, the keyboard display, the keyboard is a relatively easy question because um, there's an I squared C connector. So the keyboard is actually a completely separate PCB that you could fabricate yourself. And uh, it just has a connector that you can find on, on, on the local. DigiKey or whatever. Or, yeah, mouse or whatever. DigiKey, mouse or that sort of thing. And uh, it does have a, an I squared C uh, output. If I'm not yep, wrong. it does. And uh, it's it's a server, so it is a server in SUS that takes those keyboard inputs and sends them up to the input layer. So it is a weekend project, really, to get a well, grab a PCB to go to some cheap PCB shop like Osh Park or PCB or one of these these PCB vendors and get a custom adapter board made to go from I squared C to PS2. Mm. Uh, actually, I think G they're GPIOs, right? They're GPIOs, yeah, you could actually so, just yeah, bit bang directly. Just, yeah. yeah, add a GPIO module to the CPU yeah. and you have a PS2, yeah. you add some level shift to, yeah. to go yeah. from those pins to PS2. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's 5 volts, I think? No, 3.3, 3. yeah. PS2 is, is Pre uh, uh, ancient, um, probably 5 volts. Um, <laughs> level shifter, right? Yeah, what's well, so. USB? USB is 5 volts. Oh, okay. yeah. but, uh, yeah. I don't know, I would need to see. But in terms of extending the system to support that sort of thing, it's definitely in there and is not uh, too difficult to do so. Yeah, I think okay. that's basically, yeah, yeah. 
so then the, there's a question about, okay, the, the LCD is a sharp memory LCD. So it's from mm -hmm. that series okay. that answers okay. that one. I don't, I didn't quite get the BJT versus uh, 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 MOSFET, but it, it's talking about the transistors on the LCD itself. They are, they're amorphous TFT MOSFETs. They're not BJTs. Okay. Um, and then there's a fourth question, which I'm sure I'm missing. What is it? Which was, has anybody done any exploring with the Braille or non-screen version? Oh, Braille on screen. So basically like a, a display that can have bumps or something like this that, that yeah, you can yeah, read. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, no for, for the Braille version, we're using audio feedback um, that you can, they use to, the, so basically mm. there's a, there, there's, there's a six key keyboard that are the six dots of Braille that you type on to enter your stuff and then it will speak using one of the open source mm. uh, text-to-speech engines and tell you what you're typing. Um, I think I did look a little bit at those sort of those those like live bumpy braille leader things. They're really cool, but they're very mechanically complex and a bit outside the scope currently. But it's it's something that uh, I think would be neat to look at someday. Now, I did have a question um, about the memory memory LCD um, saying is memory LCD a security issue, though? Um, so what? So I'm obviously obviously not because you've chosen it. Um, so can well, you so it's so the memory and the memory LCD. I mean, it seems like right. someone might be able to right. access that, but is that not the case? So it's called a memory LCD, and the reason why it's called a memory LCD is because each uh, pixel element contains the memory it needs to retain its state. So you can look at the circuit, and basically, it's an address mux, and then each instead of just a TFT that drives a pixel element, it's actually a bit of memory that can retain it. So when you cut the power, mm. and you cut the drive, the pixel retains its state. And so there is, there, is a, there is a security issue in that if you were trying to scuttle your device, like, you know, you had something on the screen and you want to hide it from someone who's walking over and reading over your shoulder, you have to actively clear it. If you just cut the power, you have, what you'll find is that this, the last image will just fade away very slowly. It'll take like maybe mm. five, 10 minutes for it to really just fully disappear because the memory LC will retain that last bit of the screen. But because the device actually includes a self-destruct feature, presumably you, you don't just want to get rid of it on the screen. You want to get rid of all your crypto keys. You want to get rid of all the secrets entirely. There's actually a self-destruct feature built into the device. And part of self-destruct routine, we clear the screen to zeros, at which point the memory is nulled. We clear the AES keys that encrypt the sort of the FPGA root uh, key box to null. And then if there's still power remaining in the device, this all takes milliseconds, but you know, say someone's coming along and trying to like pull the battery out of your device, say you have to do it in milliseconds, it'll, it'll start chunking through the flash memory and, and just erasing everything like crazy until, until the power is cut. So it should be able to pretty effectively scuttle itself. And as part of, that, part of the routine uh, to scuttle itself, it includes clearing out the LCD. Very cool. Thank you for explaining that. Um, so. I've, I've got a question from, um, from a guy called Benjamin Sherry, um, which is actually preempting my next question to you, because I want to take, I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about tool chains. So I've been watching some of Tim Ansell's talks on open source FPGA tool chains and kind of keeping an eye on what's going on in the movement. It seems to be, it seems to be very exciting what's happening in open FPGA at the moment. But I, I also know that you, for, for this board, you've been, it's, it's based on a Xilinx Spartan 7, right? Yep. So can you, uh, right. Can you yeah, so can you tell me a little bit about, A, why you chose an FPGA over a more traditional SOC? And B, your choice of FPGA, like which which FPGA you chose, and also, you know, I'd like to I'd like to know a little bit more about the tool chain that you're using, um, okay. and like and why. So it's a very, it's, that's, that's a big you question. Do you want to go into it? It's up to you. What? Do you want me? Do you want me um, to answer it? I mean, also. You, you, which, yeah. If it's if it if it's if it's any if it makes any difference, you're it's much easier to hear you, Benny, than it is Zobs. So if there's oh. people, of, there's, <laughs> I see. Because all right, it, I'll, I'll, you're, you're I'll, quite I'll, quiet I'll. unless you speak into the microphone. But I believe you can't really get any closer, or you'll get put I, in. Like, right, he's got the microphone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. All right, so I'll I'll just go quickly. Mm. He can answer the same question, but well, I'll, 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 I'll go through yeah. the, the talking points quickly. Um, so uh, 
an SOC, part of the idea is to have an evidence-based reason to trust your hardware. And one of the problems with SOCs and chips in general is that, we, is that there's currently no good technology to inspect if that little fleck of silicon actually contains what it says on the outside it, there's, without destroying it. So we can use SEMs, we can do layer things, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do there, actually fairly cost effective to reverse engineer it, one sample, but then that sample is no longer usable. You don't, you get a new one, you're like, well, is this the same as it was? I don't know, let's take it apart, and now it's broken. So there's this chicken and egg problem around SOC is that a couple of years from now, we have projects to hopefully solve, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Today, here and now, with an FPGA, you get a generic piece of logic. So out of the box, actually a precursor does nothing because the FPGA is not configured. The idea is that that generic sea of gates then gets a bitstream pattern loaded into it that turns it into a precursor. That bitstream pattern is a huge search space in terms of where the specific bits get located. So if someone wants to go ahead and try to exploit it or put a backdoor on the inside or do something like this, they're going to have to do something fairly large, fairly detectable, fairly robust to, to make sure that they get your specific version of the bitstream uh, attacked a priori by putting an implant in the fab in Taiwan or wherever these things are built, right? And so, and so that significantly ups the bar in terms of the silicon exploit side, and it's what we can do today to sort of plug the hole around uh, trust-based, um, uh, evidence-based trust for the CPU itself, right? And so then that's why we go with an FPGA versus a standard SOC. It does come with trade-offs in terms of performance. An FPGA can only run at about 100 megahertz, whereas if we did the same thing in an SOC, we'd be running at hundreds of megahertz, right? Orders of magnitude more performance, but it's good enough. I, I think we're there. Um, and then there was a question about tool chain, I believe, right? And so, uh, so Tim Ansel, as you mentioned, he's working on a wonderful product, SimbaFlow and Project X-Ray, to create a full open source tool chain for the Spartan 7. And um, we hope to eventually be able to implement Precursor using these full open source tools, but they're not quite there yet. And so uh, in an effort to go ahead and get this shipped earlier, we're using the Xyrenx proprietary Vivado tool chain, which is free to download, but not free as in freedom, right? It's free as in beer, but not free as in freedom. And so, uh, but you, you, you can go ahead and just register on their site and download a copy. It's huge. It's 100 gigabytes. It has log4j on the inside. It has all the things you don't want inside closed source software, right? But, but it's there and you can use it. Um, and, uh, and you can compile your stuff down to a bitstream and we can actually inspect the bitstream and see if anything has been put on the inside because of Project X-Ray, we can actually inspect the big stream and see if anything's not in place. The good news is we've written everything inside Lidex, which is a uh, you know, Megan-based um, Python hardware description language. And so once Tim gets the Spartan 7 targets slotted into SimbaFlow and whatever it is, in theory, this should port directly over into that system. That's the hope, yeah. right? Um, and so, and so, at some point, when that software is ready, we can go ahead and flip a switch and go live into the full open source tool chain. So it's one of those things where we're trying to put the, you know, the wheels on the plane as it's taking off the road and trying to get everything done. And so, one of the compromises we're using the, the tool chain we can have now to get it done. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, and when you're two, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. Uh, the other thing is that there's actually two FPGAs in there. There's the SOC and then it's the EC. And the EC is using an EC, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ICE 40, which does have a fully open source tool chain. And in fact, we are using the ICE Storm um, uh, Next PNR tool chain for that. So it is a little bit open. But the big SOC uh, is uh, you still using the closed source of auto tool chain. So it's, it's going to, you know, we'll get there eventually, is the goal. Mm, mm, mm. That's really awesome. Um, that, that, that was really good. I could hear you really well there. So thank you for sharing that microphone. I think that was the clearest I've heard you all night, Sean. Okay, I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah, do, I'll yeah. do that in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, in fact, while we've got this, because I did have a question for Zobs, um, which was about about how to how do you approach develop sorry <laughs> how do you approach developing software for like a hardware project like this that is where trust is that important is is it the same you know like what approach do you take huh. that is an excellent question that is a really good question um whoever 
Um, that was my question. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> good job. You should, you should. <laughs> uh, Thank so, you. No one's ever told me I've, I've given an excellent question before. <laughs> Uh, no, so it's when you when you deal with uh, this sort of thing, needing to worry about security, a lot of it is mm -hmm. trying to figure out how could things possibly go wrong. And that's one of the nice things about using Rust is that it won't compile if you don't handle all the things that could possibly go wrong. Um, yeah. well, most of the things, at least, because error handling, is, it's not like other languages where when an error occurs, you throw an error and hopefully you deal with it somewhere. Um, you must deal with any sorts of errors. You know, one of the things that we use an awful lot is uh, non-zero use size, which is a type in Rust that is guaranteed to never be zero, which means it's never going to be null. Um, a lot of time, you know, even in Java, you have to deal with things like null pointer exceptions. So a lot of it is just defensive programming and making it so that it is as inconvenient as possible to write software that can get in an undefined state. Uh, mm -hmm. Rust is a nice programming language because it has all of these, these safety features in it that uh, make it difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to, to do this sort of thing. Uh, that doesn't mean that you don't get into really weird errors. Uh, for example, there have been many times where Bunny has uh, come to me with a problem where when it compiles in this particular way, suddenly, um, what was it? Uh, values start returning either true or false depending on the length of the path that gets compiled oh, with. Yeah, that um, <laughs> yeah, and it turns out that was a problem, well, in unsafe code in Rust, where uh, I, it was a loader, actually. It was loading two pages of memory into the same, uh, same address space. So basically, two threads were sharing the same stack, which gets really, it makes things really very unhappy and very difficult to, to compile. But Mostly what you need to, it's, it's the same as any other weird issue like this. You need to figure out what could possibly be causing this unexplained behavior. This shouldn't be possible, but clearly it's possible because it's currently happening. Uh, and trying to narrow down the, the, the sources of this particular thing. Like, yeah, I think this one, this particular problem was because the length of the path caused it to hit exactly 4096 bytes. Um, it hit a bug in the loader that caused it to right. skip a page. It was an elf format. Thing, yeah, it was right? an elf yeah. format thing. The way um, the elf format packed or something like that caused uh, a section to fall into. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I I, 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 was just looking at this today. It was a, it was a, the length of the path caused the elf file to just have one of the sections flip into another page which had different permissions in it, and and this just leads to one of those legacy issues with elf format itself, which I, I have a issue open on our github it's like what the fuck are these guys doing they pack together different pages with different permissions on the sub page size granularity but it's just been built in the standard since before they had virtual memory and so everyone does this and i'm like how does the world exist and no one's like fixed this yet it's but it's just the way it is and so that's the way we have to use it yeah it's, it's one of those things where it underlies the entire history of everything but until you are building an operating system you don't go to think to ask about this sort of thing yeah. um but yeah to answer the question uh, lots of defensive programming, uh, while at the same time just taking every single error you see and uh, not uh, just waving it away as something weird the computers do. All right, let's take a look in the comments section before I move on to the next question I've got for you, because we, we've got a very, very busy comment section tonight. It's actually been very sociable. So thank you, everybody, for... Um, for chatting, yachida, cheers. <laughs> um, so I've got a few questions here. So let's go from the bottom up, which is not particularly um, useful way to do. But it's a, oh my goodness, this is an old fashioned. Okay, this is an old question. So, <laughs> we've got a question asking, can I run Chumby apps on the precursor? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Chumbi actually know. had 32 megabytes of memory, which needed to include uh. the Linux kernel. Uh, th there's a couple of reasons why you couldn't do that. One is that the touchscreen, this doesn't have a touchscreen. It looks like it should yeah. have a touchscreen, uh, but touchscreen controllers tend to be a uh, fairly high transistor count, uh, especially the cap touch. Um, the Chumbi also had 320 megahertz. 
whereas this has 100 megahertz. We did run it on a couple of experimental low power boards internally, but it did not run well. Uh, then there's the other reason that it's flash, and you'd need to use some modern implementation of flash, which generally involves transpiling it to JavaScript. Uh, and none of the JavaScript interpreters will run very well in uh, eight megabytes of memory. So it's not okay. really feasible to do that. But that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> there's lots of chumby love in the <laughs> lots of chumby love in the comments. Um, so is anything new on the database file system that um, Zobs has been creating? Funny. I'm not sure what. Yeah. Uh, 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 this is the PDDB. I think he's asking about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that the actually the PDDB fell on on onto this this side of the table. Um, actually, yeah. So the plausibly deniable database. I think the, what he's asking about is um, there's this uh, wonderful XKCD comic, which uh, shows a fictional scenario where there's two nerds like we've created this unbreakable cryptography and blah blah blah, and there's like these guys trying to get into it, and they say no good. It's forty nine six bit RSA. We're going to have to just give up. And then the next panel is like. How it actually happens? Take this five dollar wrench and beat it out of him, right? And so, and so, and, and, and so, and so, it's sort of like the 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 rubber hose cryptanalysis exploit, right? And so, the the problem is, is as technologists, as we build better tools to keep secrets, what you don't want to do is you don't want the human to become the target, mm. right? That's actually not productive at all. Uh, to make it so secure that the old, you know, that, that all of a sudden your life becomes the thing in exchange for your secrets, right? And so uh, one of the things that I want to design into is plausible deniability, which is that you, you can't say for sure whether all the secrets have been disclosed on a device or not. So if you're, say, at a customs checkpoint and uh, someone wants to go ahead and uh, say, oh, in order to enter this country, we give me all the passwords to your device, right? You want to be able to... Uh, you know, give them a list of passwords and say, this is all of them, Scout's Honor, right? And there's no forensic device or technique. You can't look at the free space. You can't look at the crypto tables. You can't do whatever. And be like, oh, I see a blob here that's still encrypted. What's, what about that? What's this all about, right? So there's no, you know, so a lot of the traditional sort of um, encrypted file systems, you can still see the evidence, the footprint of their existence on the device. The fact that there, there's even a mountable volume or, or a blob that hasn't been discussed. So... Uh, I've created a, a file system, if you will. I call it the plausibly de deniable database. And the whole thing looks like free space initially, right? Like nothing is distinguishable. It's all just encrypted free space. Um, and um, the process of deleting a file is equivalent to forgetting the password to it. That is exactly how files are deleted, right? So if you are like, I want to delete something, you just just convince yourself you forgot the key and it is as well as deleted, right? That's as crypto, cryptographically deleted. And so um, uh, the past couple months, I've, I've actually gotten to the point where the, the file system exists. It's in the development branch. It's not been pushed to our main yet. It's in my, my development branch. Passes a whole bunch of tests so we can create what I call it. So the way it works is you have multiple bases. And so the idea mm -hmm. is that when you boot the system, a basis comes up that has your system basis, which has things like your Wi-Fi password and some other low value secrets on the inside, your contact book. And then you unlock a new basis. I say, I want to unlock the Sean basis. I type in Sean's name and the password. And then on top, the reason why it's a dictionary is inside the dictionary are injected keys that are related to Sean. So the exact same application that was a contact book now all of a sudden has injected into it the secrets that were Sean's. Right, and then when I close the basis, those keys disappear from the contact book. Right, so the application layer doesn't need to know about the plausibly deniable stuff. That's actually part of the plausibly deniable feature of it. Right, and so so we now have the, the point where you have multiple bases can be opened and closed, keys you know created and deleted, whatever it is, go through a whole rigmarole. And I'm currently just right now in the process of trying to uh, do the UX integration for it, which is that means long rat hole of all these mistakes I made and building the UI and trying to fix all these problems. But that's, that's, that's where it is right now. So. All right. I've got one more question from the comments as well saying, are there any microcontrollers in the hardware chain needed to load the initial bit stream for the FPGA? And, and if so, um, how do you verify them? So how do you load that initial bit stream? The FPGA oh. self loads it from the ROM. Okay. So, okay. so, so there's, so there's, so there's, there's, yeah, there's a ROM on the inside that's hooked up, and then the FPGA has the ability to load its own bitstream. I think that's a question he's asking, and not, 
Yeah, 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 there's I also think a question so. about so. where did it come from initially? I mean, it comes from an SBI device, and that was programmed in a factory in Korea. So, you know, Bunny was just there, so he verified it when he was there. Right. Um, mm. Yeah, the, the FPGA, both of them actually are self-loading from a, an SBI ROM. Right? And, okay. and, and if you don't, don't trust the factory, you can go ahead and copy your own bitstream into the spy ROMs yourself. Okay, cool. And I'm looking through more. There's so much love for the Chumbies in the comments. <laughs> And a mention of an NETV as well. So there's some like <laughs> some some old things. Okay, but I, I, I want to move on. I want to talk to you because I've been watching, I've, like many other people, I've been really, really enjoying your dispatches from your recent visit to the factory now. Um, so there's there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about here. I want to talk to you about the factory visit, but but before before we move on to that, I, I'd also like to everybody I speak I speak to at, so these tear drying sessions are a weekly thing. I talk to engineers every at noon every Friday normally. You're special because you know you're yeah because we're in Singapore Wednesday at nine p.m. Yeah. exactly. It's no, no, noon no. here. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, but but, we, um, but normally, so I'm hearing lots and lots of engineers and hardware hackers like complaining constantly about the supply chain crisis. And everybody's got a story, right? So I was wondering, do you have any supply chain crisis stories, or is there anything you'd like to get off of your chest? <laughs> is there anything you'd like to have a whinge about? <laughs> like, well, you know, uh, I always say hardware people end up being pretty heavy drinkers for a reason. That's not wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, no. I, I've, I've got a question, buddy. What is the longest lead time component you've seen? Oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> so the, one of the problems right now actually is that the current batch that's being sent to the backers is probably the last yeah. batch for a year. It's uh, like the, the, What? Yeah, yeah cuz the good the good news is we did the we did the funding campaign if you remember when we mm. did the crowdfunding, crowdfunding campaign, there was an election, and we did we had Trump as the president of the United States, right? That was the scenario when we I did remember. the campaign. Yeah, I was and immigrating so, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, yeah. regrets, hopefully. <laughs> Anyways, so 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 um, so the supply chain crisis hadn't started when we closed funding yet, and so we mm. had normal lead times on most things, normal being 28 to 30 plus weeks, whatever it is, except for the FPGA has got pushed a little longer, like almost 40 weeks, something like this. Today, the same parts are quoting 52 plus. We have some 70 week lead time parts. Like, so, so like, like I actually, before these have even shipped, I had to place a purchase order for the next round and those still won't ship to you in a year. It's like, it's wow. insane how hard it is to buy parts right now. Um, yeah. And so, uh, the problem is that even though we had placed some parts uh, back in January, people have been stealing them off of our reels, effectively. So we will, we what, would, we, how, what, explain that a little bit. What do you mean stealing them? I so, mean, so, 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 no, so, no, physically taking them. Well, so you place a yeah. purchase order for 2000 parts and then the yeah. factory receives them and counts them and they say, Hey, we have 1870 of them. Right, so somewhere 230 of them, or whatever odd, 130 of them odd parts went missing. Right, this never happens. We never receive short reels of parts. Right, and then we go and we look for the parts that are missing. Right, there were like 60 cent parts or whatever it is, and they're on the gray market for five dollars, six dollars a piece. Right, so someone wow. in the chain, and I don't know who it is, but they're, they're you know we're getting the reels into the warehouses, and when the, when they actually arrive at the point of SMT. They're short some parts. Wow. Right. And so and so and so if that's not yeah, that's that's pretty shitty as it is. But the good news is that us being having a little experience, we always order a little for scrap because when you load them into like the you know the SMT feeder, a few of them fall off, whatever it is. So generally the amount that people have been trimming off have been within that margin, right? So we lose like 20, 30 parts of the really valuable ones. So we're like, well, that sucks. It means we're gonna have to hand solder on some points that got you know, fell out the SMT feed or wherever it is, but we can still meet the production run. Uh, but we, we did have like well, one part that was a crystal oscillator. I actually put a blog post up about it recently. Yeah, about, yeah, I, it's really yeah. good. So anybody yeah. anybody who doesn't know, we, this, this is a great story that's just been published on yeah. Benny's blog, which I'm sure everybody reads already, but yeah, yeah. carry on. Yeah. Tell the story, yeah. tell the story. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll summarize it because I probably people may, they can read it anyways. But basically there's, a, there's actually a really cool oscillator that uh, we found 
that is a silicon-based MEMS oscillator. It's actually about 100 times lower power. It's about half the footprint. Whatever. It's a, got all these great metrics to it, right? So it's actually very hard to justify using anything else, particularly in the low power section of our device. Um, and back when we designed it in, there were gobs and gobs of them on the marketplace, right? Uh, we ordered a lot. Um, and then again, these came short. This one came short by 350 on the reel, right? Actually, no more than 500 on the reel, I think was the total shortage. Nope, sorry, I take it back. What ha sorry, what happened was actually going back to the whole story. This one, the distributor full out canceled on us, right? So we ordered 28 weeks later, there's a 30 week lead time thing, 28 weeks later, zero arrived, right? And the, the distributor sends us a note saying, sorry, we had to cancel it because the machine that we use to program these things is, is broken and we can't fix it due to the supply chain crisis, right? And, we're, and so we had waited, we had waited the whole penalty time and then found out just a couple of weeks before delivery that they were unavailable. And so the reason why we end up 350 pieces short is that we then panic bought every single, we just went you know, on, on every single website and bought every single legitimate source you could and we're still 350 pieces short, right? So that's how we end up 350. So this one, this one was actually a full cancellation, right? Um, wow. Anyways, yeah, so, so long story, we went, we, I, I'm, I'm placing bets across the table. I'm buying from Element 14. I'm buying from Newark. I'm buying from all these different places, trying to trying to hopefully get some parts in in time for the SMT start because this is one of the few parts that are not available. And because it's an oscillator, we can't just sub it out at the last minute because you have to go through EMC certification over again, right? So it's just a non-fungible part. It's like not only does it impact performance, it impacts our schedule. Uh, and uh, it turned out at the end of the day that uh, uh, DigiKey could – program the parts and make them, but they had a website configuration error that didn't let them show up on the website as orderable, right? And so effectively they didn't exist in the world if you couldn't order them through DigiKey, it's one of those weird things. And so uh, after talking to SciTime and confirming it's an orderable part, I talked to DigiKey and the technical guy there, DigiKey's great, you can get on live chat and talk to the guy and he was really just fine. He's like, yeah, no, we. I just checked here, the order codes are there, we, they're just not on the website. So I then finally found through a couple of uh, customer service reps, this one, this wonderful lady, uh, Mel Stentz, she was just like, she like I, I, I drew the lottery, got the you know the DigiKey rep, and she and she just picked up the ball and ran with it. This is like classic, you own it, you fix it. Like just you know she wasn't gonna, she wasn't going to let the buck pass her. She was she was she was so committed to fixing this problem for me. She was like, we are going to fix this for you. You are going to ship your product. Don't worry about it, right? She was and she was just like. Like going through and like, oh, it looks like there's an order code here, but the quote can't come up, and this must be this sort of thing. I'll send some emails out, and in a few days, you'll be able to order on your website. And guess what? Three days later, we order it. A week later, it's on the line, and SMT starts. I'm just like, yes, this is so good. That's amazing. What a, what yeah. what a story. And yeah. so, as you say, like when the precursor ended, that's when it really started to crunch. The you know the end of the campaign was about the around, around the time that um, that the, the supply chain crisis really started to hit, and and everything was thrown into disarray. So, I was, it, it, both for the supply chain crisis purposes, but also for you know, did you have to make any changes to your design from the prototype that you were showing as you went into actual manufacturing into production were there any like changes that you made um we weren't allowed to let's put it that way because we got we, we went for emc certification i, w I mm. wish we could have oh. things would have been easier if we could have if we could have swapped some things out but because uh we actually cared to get the ce and fcc certification once we got past that gate which was around like june or july we actually had the chamber test done it took three months for the certificates to issue that's different different problem but um, once we got the chamber test done, we didn't have to repeat the chamber tests to uh, sub out any components before we ship. And so uh, that was around the time where things started to get really dicey and, and things were starting to disappear from the supply chain. So there's a bunch of things I'm like, I'm like, I really wish we could. But you know what? We'll just buy the expensive open market conversions because it's going to be a $3,000 chamber exercise and a recertification anyways. And so once you sum it together, it's not going to be worth it. So we end up actually paying a bit extra for the parts because of the certification. Um, the next precursor run will probably actually have some some sub outs, to be honest, uh, because you know we can afford the chamber time and the recertification. But it's really right now the buyers. I just well, actually what I'm kind of counting on is that the buyers out there trying to source and they, they're recording I don't know 70 week lead times, whatever it is. But what I what, I, what I'm kind of guessing is that after the Christmas season is over, what happened is a lot of people. Uh, over ordered and there's not actually 
there's going to be more devices than people bought. There's going to be like, you know, everyone thinks they're going to buy uh, whatever phone or whatever gadget. And, and one of them mm -hmm. is a big seller and a bunch of them don't sell. And then the, there's a whole backlog that's in the factory that gets canceled and pushed back in the chain. And so what I'm doing is I'm going to kind of wait to see what echoes back in Q1 uh, before I make any decisions about redesigning. And then after we kind of uh, manage to pick out uh, the gray market, things that echoed back, we'll see what we have to redesign. And, and, and Sean has some comments on it too. No, the, the other really weird thing about the whole precursor development is that up until now, every product we designed has involved a lot of hands-on uh, activity. For example, Bunny mentioned mm. the, the N o'clock chamber. Normally, we're in the chamber with the device so that if they spot a problem, we can put copper tape on a particular area or figure out where the offending emissions are coming from. Uh, this had to be done completely remotely because uh, I think Bunny's trip to Korea is the first time he's left the country two years since, yeah, two years. I haven't left the country either. We've been on the city, this country, for 18 months, 24 months. 10 kilometers of the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's been a really weird couple of years. Um, yeah, and, uh, it's it's this product has been a lot less hands on, a lot more remote, work from home type thing than any other product that we've ever done, yeah. and it's just been a completely different way of doing things. Yeah, yeah. So, and 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 at the end of the day, that that effectively ties our hands as to what we can do mm. uh, in terms of substitutes and swaps, right? Like you know, it, if we were in China in person and I had to swap a component, I can. One of the things you can actually do is you can kind of sweet talk the chamber operator into like slotting in a new, like, you know, you can do things when you're in person you can't do remotely because everything has to go by the book remotely. So really it's just like my bag of tricks is really thinned out to do everything remotely. And so uh, it's been, this has just been by the book, I guess, super by the book. That was actually something that, so uh, Josh, who you know, Josh, for, this, for viewers that don't know, Josh is um, the co-founder of Cryo Supply. Um, and um, he did have a question for you. And he sent me with this book, which was, so, Benny, one of the things that you've done, this is the Essential Guide to Electronics in Shenzhen, which is an, one of the books that you've written. There's a number of other books, including The Hardware Hacker, and there was a collaboration. Wow, she has them. GP, <laughs> the, yeah, absolutely, of course I do. They're like, please do, please do support the authors. Um, but the question I had was around the guide to Shenzhen, right? How relevant is this dead tree version going to be after? Yeah. Like, how is how different is it for you now? Like, how, so, how are you managing this right. relationships so, that you? Yeah. Right. So first of all, the dead tree version, uh, ninety percent of the book is a translation guide uh, based on the Chinese language. So all that's still relevant. The Chinese language hasn't changed. Uh, through the pandemic, there is a back section, which includes maps. Those are probably worthless at this point in time. I'm almost 100% sure. So um, I have vaguely been able to sort of watch what's going on in China over people's shoulders. And um, let's just say, let's just say, trying to be politically correct here. Let's just say that the, uh, the pandemic has been an opportunity to remodel facets of society. Um, mm. And, mm. and, and I'm, I feel there are a lot of things that aren't the way they used to be. They just aren't. Uh, and they're, they're probably mm, never going true. back. And so, and so uh, actually one of the funny things is uh, sometimes people try to call me for some advice, like, Hey, I do this sort of manufacturing thing. I'm like, you know what my, the first thing I say is like, you know what? This is your golden opportunity. You know as much as I know now, right? All those years of expertise I had on the ground trying to learn things, worthless, right? Like actually your fresh eyes on it, your, your, your ability to go and explore and learn things, your lack of bias is, is an advantage over my entrenched uh, sort of views on these things. And so, and so really people who are just entering right now have a chance to sort of figure things out more rapidly than I have, because I have a legacy of vendors and suppliers that may not be able to respond as quickly to new conditions. And so I'm actually sort of, you know, I've got eyes out to the world to try and, and find out what are the new things, what's going on. You know, someone else is going to figure these things out and maybe someone else will write the next guide to Shenzhen and I'll be, and I'll be buying it and learning from it and figuring all these things out myself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that is the thing about uh, about uh, paper books, as they do go out of date, don't they? So this is, I did have a question, which is kind of like, um, uh, we're going back to FPGA talks. Um, so 
when I was when I was doing the research um, earlier today, I was I had when I was like cleaning my workshop, my my workbench um, to make it look presentable on camera. I was watching a few of your um, talks, uh, historic talks online, and something something that I'd never heard of before in hardware that you were doing um, was called the ASLR for hardware. So using randomization in FPGAs, and I thought that that was a really interesting technique, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you might use randomization in FPGAs for security. Okay. So, so, so basically the idea is that uh, an FPGA, it's a generic sea of gates, right? Which ten, th tens yeah. of thousands of elements. And, uh, and where you place an exact flip-flop or a LUT or a gate or the equation depends upon the parameters of a place and route engine, which is actually kind of stochastic. They use this, this sort of simulated and yielding hill climbing algorithm, which has these random seeds that guide the process. And you can get actually quite different outcomes from slightly different seeds, a little bit of a butterfly effect that goes on. And so one thing that we do, um, the, is that, is, this is actually a misfeature. A lot of people want repeatable code, obviously. They want repeatable designs. And so Xilinx built this thing into Vivado tools where if you have the exact same net, let's go in, the exact thing comes out again every single time, which is good for repeatability. But what we do is we actually inject a randomly generated 64-bit number in just a register that you can read. It's just, just ties up and down. And that's enough to go ahead and perturb the algorithm so that every single time that you rerun it, it, it places things differently. Um, differently enough that basically if you're like, oh, I think that, you know, the... Um, the overflow bit for the program counter is going to be here, and I want to override that so I can go ahead and divert a branch with a secret instruction, right? If I can just mm -hmm. remap this one LUT, I can do that, right? And so that would be the classic sort of exploit on an x86. I have a program counter, and, and I've got an extra unused opcode, and I execute it, and it flips a bit, and then I can go ahead and execute an instruction that's not an instruction set, right? You, 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 can't, you can't know where that bit is anymore because depending upon that 64-bit seed, the outcome of the compilation is going to be radically different. And, and now you effectively have like an ASLR for hardware. And since that like someone, someone in the foundry, in the fab, can't say this is the LUT that we have to modify to go ahead and do it. And so now you've, you've got, I've got a cluster of LUTs or like the whole device has to have a backdoor on the inside. And that greatly mm -hmm. expands the, the effort that the attacker has to have to put a, a backdoor inside the fab. Yeah, really cool. Well. Improbably, it's been an hour since we've been yes. talking to each other. Yeah. It has been an hour, and and like yes. we've covered so many topics. It's been really exciting and really interesting. We've had absolutely loads of comments going on um, as well. And um, is there anything else that you want to share, promote, talk about the future, tell people what's going on in precursor? I don't even talk about the OMUs. I really wanted to talk about the OMUs. Like, I, I, and it's been an hour, and we've not talked about the OMUs. Like, is there uh, anything it's else? It's true. Like I was just about to chat? point out that. Uh... With the uh, with FOMU, um, you know, you mentioned the, the Please, ASLR. Yeah, like it, it, when we built it, it's it's so full. It's ninety nine percent full, which is unheard of. Wait, in wait, wait. Stop, stop. And, tell them what it is. Tell them what it is first. Um, it's uh, tell them what the FOMU is. I don't think I actually have one, but it's uh, wait, it's, it's okay. uh, an I've FPGA that fits in your USB port. Oh, you have yeah. one. Wait. Oh no, no, no. I have a. I do have one somewhere else, but it, it's in on my desk, not in my. But I can show it on um, the on the inter, I can show it on the internet screen. <laughs> So <laughs> um, it's this whole range of, uh, of ultra tiny yeah. um, uh, development ports. And we actually did one that yeah, was yeah, an yeah. FPGA, hence the, uh, the F and FOMU. And uh, yeah. uses uh, the ICE 40, which has an open source tool chain, and it is 99% uh, full with the debug version. And uh, there are certain seeds that you, you include with this ASLR where it only meets timing. It only actually is guaranteed to work with about half of the seeds possible. So we use that randomization for that project to ensure that it actually works and, and works with the particular specific incarnation of something. Like it, it varies from chip to chip to the point where uh, if, if you use different seeds, then it won't actually work. Mm. So that's a phone in. So tell me what's going on with the um, oh, it. It just got really loud again. So put the microphone to your head and come yeah. up. Your, const your construction people just got a bit enthusiastic, yeah. huh? Yeah, I think, I think you're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's, so is there anything, how can people keep up to date with you um, on the internet? Is it just with both of your blogs, your Twitters, your, you know, what's the best way? Blogs and, and uh, for, for me, GitHub actually is, is where I'm most active. Like, I, I didn't even think of that as a social network until recently, but it is it's kind of where all of my social yeah. activity does. And what's uh, your handle guess, on GitHub? Is it all Zobs as well? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. XOBS. I, I was trying to put an E in there. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, for me, probably just uh, you can you can watch my Twitter feed, Bunny Studios, mm -hmm. and uh, I have my blog, BunnyStudios.com. And we always uh, we we do try to get stuff out to the precursor community first, specific precursor by putting them through the crowd supply updates. So go ahead and subscribe to that list, and uh, you'll get the most relevant updates there on the whole thing. Um, that should be that should probably pretty, pretty much cover it. Yeah, and we have an IRC channel as well. So uh, I don't I don't remember the handle off the top of my head. It's it's Matrix under uh, Betrusted. Yeah? Okay, Matrix under Betrusted, and uh, and uh, and so that's a good way to sort of just leave like casual comments and and hopefully get a response. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, really great. Well, it's been it, we we've gone past our time. It's been really yeah. really wonderful to talk to both. I, I got a bowl because I actually have a flight to catch. <laughs> exactly. First time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. I know. Don't <laughs> exactly. want to be late. Let you go. Got to pass exactly. the art test. Yeah. I know. So thank you so much for joining both of us. And also, Benny, I I noticed your T-shirt halfway through the stream, and I had to stop laughing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. So thank you both for joining us. And also thank you both. You've had so many positive comments, you know, for your past work, your comment, your, your current collaborations and your future. So if you, lots of people love you. We all want you to carry on doing what you're doing. Thank you for joining us so much. And for those of us who, for, for those of you who are interested in winning the precursor, remember to go to the Xilinx um, FPGA Playground page subscribe to updates by Friday and I will choose a winner on Friday okay um, and then what else do I need to say is there anything what have your closing comments before I end the stream well, just, uh, thank you everybody for coming and supporting us and uh, being interested in open hardware and open software yeah yeah we've had hundreds of comments it's been yeah. really nice um, yeah thanks everyone yeah, thank for tuning for keeping in us all company yeah yeah absolutely. and, uh, and uh, we will uh, we're hopefully going to ship something but, uh, you know, there was recently an outbreak of Omicron in, no, no, I mean, there's a recent outbreak of Omicron in, Dom, in Dongguan. And, uh, oh, no. and some of, yeah, yeah. And so our, our mechanical cases are finished and they were literally on a dock to be picked up, but they just shut down the whole city. And so we have no idea no. how long it's going to be, yeah, until the cases can be picked up and transported to the factory in Korea. So, uh, you know, developing story as it comes. Wow. Okay. Well, thanks Boom. for keeping us up to date there. That's that's quite a note to end the street on. To end the stream on there, Benny. <laughs> well, yeah, sorry. Like, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. But you know, just just so you know, just so you know. By the way, just so you know. Just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> Omicron <Yeah>. and Dongguan. <laughs> Well, we, there's lots of love for you in the chat. Everybody, like, um, thank you for joining us. But also, if you, um, I'm, I'm going to do another stream noon PST Friday, twelve. Wait, I already said noon. I already said noon. It's late. It's late. So noon Friday PSD. Join me. I am talking to Darian Johnson, who is the creator of the open hardware Newt, which is um, a a home assistant and um, all, all the Alexa, etc., compatible smart display. So come, so, so come along to that one as well. There'll be more fun and shenanigans. Um, so thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Thank you to Benny and Zobs. And thank you to our stream sponsor, Xilinx, um, who have given us lots of bountiful goodies to give away as well, which yep. you will, will have been notified. Okay, bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks. See you guys.